Good morning, everyone. The uh, Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Commerce will now come to order. Uh, member, uh, we'll begin with member statements, and I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you for joining us here today. Given what's going on in the, uh, in the world, it's uh, really impressive to see the, uh, the turnout that is here today, and I welcome everyone. Um, in the uh, two plus decades since the creation of the internet, we've seen life for Americans and their families transformed in many positive ways. The internet provides new opportunities for commerce, education, information, and connecting people. However, along with these many new opportunities, we have seen new challenges as well. Bad actors are stalking the online marketplace using deceptive techniques to influence consumers' um, uh, deceptive designs uh, to, uh, to fool them. Are we okay? Oh, okay. Um, deceptive designs to, uh, to fool them into giving away personal information, stealing their money, and engineering um, uh, in, in other unfair practices. The Federal Trade Commission works to protect Americans from many unfair and deceptive practices, but a lack of resources, authority, and even a lack of will has left many American consumers feeling helpless in this digital world. Adding to that feeling of helplessness, new technologies are increasing the scope and scale of the problem. Deep fakes, man, uh, manipulation um, of video, dark patterns, bots, and other technological uh, technologies are hurting us in direct and indirect ways. Congress has unfortunately taken a laissez-faire approach to regulation of unfair and deceptive practices online over the past decade and platforms have let them flourish. The result is big tech failed to, res to respond to the grave threats posed by deep fakes and evidence as evidenced by Facebook scrambling to, scrambling to announce a new policy that strikes me as wholly inadequate, we'll talk about that later, since it would have uh, done nothing to prevent the alternative, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the video of Speaker Pelosi that amassed 50, uh, millions of views and prompted no action by the online platform. Hopefully, our discussion today can change my mind about that. Underlying all of this is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which provides online platform links like Facebook a legal liability shield for third-party content. Many have argued that this liability shield results in online platforms not adequately policing their, their platforms, including online piracy and extremist content. Thus, here we are with big tech wholly unprepared to tackle the challenges we face today. A top-line concern for this subcommittee must be to protect consumers readiness um, regardless of whether they are online or not. For too long, big tech has argued that um, e-commerce and digital platforms deserve special treatment and a light regulatory touch. We are finding out that consumers can be harmed as easily online as in the physical world and in some cases that online dangers are greater. It is incumbent on us to, uh, in this subcommittee, in this subcommittee, um, to make clear that protecting the, at the, at the protections that apply to in-person commerce also apply to virtual space. 
I think that witness, I thank the witnesses for their testimony today, and I recognize Ranking Member Rogers for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Strakowski. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, welcome to our witnesses. I appreciate the chair leading this effort today to highlight online de deception. I do want to note that last Congress, Chairman Walden also held several hearings on platform responsibility. Disinformation is not a new problem. It was also an issue 130 years ago. When Joseph Pulitzer and the New York World and William Randolph Hearst and the New York Journal led the age of, quote, yellow journalism. Just like clickbait on an online platforms today, fake and sensational headlines sold newspapers and boosted advertising revenue. With far more limited sources of information available in the 1890s, the American people lost trust in the media. To rebuild trust, newspapers had to clean up their act. Now the Pulitzer is associated with something very different. I believe we are at a simil similar inflection point today. We're losing faith in sources we can trust online. To rebuild it, this subcommittee, our witness panel, and members of the media are putting the spotlight on abuses and deception. Our committee's past leadership and constructive debates have already led to efforts by platforms to take action. Just this week, Facebook announced a new policy to combat deep fakes, in part by utilizing artificial intelligence. I appreciate Ms. Bickert for being here to discuss this in greater detail. Deep fakes and disinformation can be handled with innovation and empowering people with more information. On the platforms they choose and trust, it makes far more productive outcomes when people can make the best decisions for themselves, rather than relying on the government to make decisions for them. That's why we should be focusing on innovation for major breakthroughs, not more regulations or government mandates. As we discuss ways to combat manipulation online, we must ensure that America will remain the global leader in AI development. There's no better place in the world to raise people's standard of living and make sure that this technology is, respons is used responsibly. Software is already available to face swap, lip sync, and create facial reenactment to fabricate content. As frightening as it is, we can also be using AI to go back after the bad actors and fight fire with fire. We, can we cannot afford to shy away from it. Because who would you rather lead the world in machine learning technology? America or China? China is sharing its AI surveillance technology with other authoritarian governments like Venezuela. It's also using this technology to control and suppress ethnic minorities, including the Wurjis in Chinese concentration camps. The New York Times has reported just last month that China is collecting DNA samples and could be using this data to create images of faces. Could China be building a tool to further crack, uh, track and crack down on minorities and political dis dissidents? Imagine the propaganda and lies that could develop with this technology behind the great Chinese firewall, where there's no free speech or an independent press to hold the Communist Party accountable. That is why America must lead the world in AI development. By upholding our American values, we can use this as a force for good and save people's lives. For example, AI technology and deep learning algorithms can help us detect cancers earlier and more quickly. Clinical trials are already underway making major breakthroughs to diagnose cancers. The continued leadership of our innovators is crucial to make sure that we have the tools to combat online deception. To win the future in a global economy, America should be writing the rules for this technology so that real people, not an authoritarian state like China, are empowered. I'm also glad that we're putting a spotlight on dark patterns. Deceptive laws, fake reviews, and bots are the latest version of robocall scams. I'm pleased that the FTC has used its Section 5 authority to target this fraud and protect people. We should get their input as to how we discuss how to handle dark patterns. We also must be careful where we legislate so that we don't harm the practices that people enjoy. 
A heavy-handed regulation will make it impossible for online retailers to provide discounts. This would especially hurt lower and middle-income families. In a digital marketplace, services people enjoy should not get swallowed up by strict definition of a dark pattern. How we make these distinctions is important. So I look forward to today's discussion. I want to thank the panel, and I, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, chair of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Americans increasingly rely on the Internet for fundamental aspects of their daily lives. Consumers shop online for products ranging from groceries to refrigerators. They use the Internet to telecommute commute or to check the weather and traffic before leaving for the office, and they use social media networks to connect with family and friends and as a major source of news and information. When consumers go online, they understandably assume that the reviews of the products that they buy are real, that the people on their social networks are human, and that the news and information they're reading is accurate. And unfortunately, that is not always the case. Online actors, including nation states, companies, and individual fraudsters, are using online tools to manipulate and deceive Americans. While some methods of deception are well known, many are new and sophisticated, fooling even the most savvy consumers. Today, technology has made it difficult, if not impossible, for typical consumers to recognize what's real from what's fake. And why exactly are people putting so much effort into the development and misuse of technology? because they know that trust is the key to influencing and taking advantage of people. Whether for social, monetary, or political gain, if bad actors can make people believe a lie, then they can manipulate us into taking actions we wouldn't otherwise take. In some instances, we can no longer even trust our eyes. Videos can be slowed to make someone appear intoxicated. Faces can be photoshopped onto someone else's body. Audio can be edited in a way that a, t that a person's words are basically taken out of context. And the extent of such manipulation has become extreme. Machine learning algorithms can now create completely fake videos known as deep fakes that look real. Deep fakes can show real people saying or doing things that they never said or did. For example, face swapping technology has been used to place actor Nicolas Cage into movies where he never was. Actor director Jordan Peele created a deep fake supposedly uh, showing President Obama insulting President Trump. The most common use of deepfakes is non-consensual pornography, which has been used to make it appear as if celebrities have been videotaped in compromising positions. And deepfake technology was also used to humiliate a journalist from India who was reporting on an eight-year-old rape victim. Advances in algorithms are also behind the glut of social media bots, automated systems that interact on social media as if they were real people. These bots are used by companies and other entities to build popularity of brands and respond to consumer service requests. Even more alarming is the use of these bots by both state and non-state actors to spread disinformation, which can influence the very fabric of our society and our politics. And manipulation can be very subtle. Deceptive designs, sometimes called dark patterns, capitalize on knowledge of our senses, operate to trick us into making choices that benefit the business. Have you ever tried to unsubscribe from a mailing list and there's a button to stay subscribed that's bigger and more colorful than the unsubscribe button? And that's deceptive design. Banner ads have been designed with black spots that look like dirt or hair on the screen to trick you into tapping the ad on your smartphone. And there's so many other examples. And since these techniques are designed to go unnoticed, most consumers have no idea they're happening. In fact, they're almost impossible for experts in types of techniques to detect. And while, while computer scientists are working on technology that can help detect each of these deceptive techniques, we're in a technological arms race. As detection technology improves, so does the deceptive technology. Regulators and platforms trying to combat deception are left playing a whack-a-mole. Unrelenting advances in these technologies and their abuse raise significant questions for all of us. What is the prevalence of these deceptive techniques? How are these techniques actually affecting our actions and decisions? What steps are companies and regulators taking to mitigate consumer fraud and misinformation? So I look forward to beginning to answer these questions with our expert witness panel today so we can start to provide more transparency and tools for consumers to fight misinformation uh, and deceptive practices. And, and uh, um, Madam Chair, I just want to say, I think this is a very important hearing. Um, I was just telling um, my colleague, uh, Kathy Castor, this morning about a discussion that we had 
um, at our uh, chairs meeting this morning uh, where the topic was brought up. And I, and I said, oh, you know, we're having a hearing on this today. So this is something that a lot of members and obviously the public care about. So thank you for having the hearing today. The gentleman yields back, and now the chair recognizes Mr. Walden, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thanks for having this hearing, and welcome everyone in the, I guess this is the second hearing of the new year. There's one started earlier upstairs, uh, but we welcome you all here. This important topic, and glad to hear from our witnesses today, even those who I'm told have <laughs> health issues this morning, but thanks for being here. Um, as with anything, the internet presents uh, bad actors with those seeking to harm others some ample opportunities to manipulate the users and take advantage of consumers, which often tend to be some of the most uh, vulnerable in the population. Arguably, the digital ecosystems uh, such that harmful acts are easily exacerbated, and as we all know, false information or fake videos spread at breakneck speeds. Um, that's why when I was chairman of this committee, we tried to tackle this uh, whole issue with platform responsibility head on. And we appreciate the input we got from uh, many. Last Congress, we, as you heard, held hearings and legislated on online platforms not fulfilling their Good Samaritan obligations, especially when it comes to online human trafficking. Uh, companies' use of algorithms and the impact such algorithms have on influencing consumer behavior. We took a look at that. Improving and expanding the reach of broadband services so rural and urban consumers of all ages can benefit in a connected world from the positive aspects of the internet. Explaining the online advertising ecosystem, preservation and promotion of cross-border data flows, a topic we need to continue to work on. Um, other related issues we face in the connected world, such as cybersecurity, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, to name just a few. We also invited the heads of the tech industry to come and explain their practices. Uh, right in this hearing room, two of the committee's highest profile hearings in recent memories focus squarely on platform responsibility. Um, CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, came and spent about five and a half hours right at that table to answer some pretty tough questions on the Cambridge Analytica debacle, as well as provide the committee with more insight into how Facebook collects consumer information and what Facebook does with that information. We also welcome the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, to provide the committee with more insight into how Twitter operates, decisions Twitter makes on its platform, and how such decisions impact consumers specifically so voices don't feel silenced. I'm pleased that Chairman Pallone uh, brought in the CEO of Reddit last uh, year and hope the trend will continue as we understand this ever-evolving and critically important ecosystem from those that sit on the top of it. This hearing today helps with that. As this group of experts shine a light on questionable practices, I hope can yield further fruitful results. Such efforts often lead to swifter actions than any government action uh, can get done. Following our series of hearings, there's proof that some companies are cleaning up their platforms and we appreciate the work you're doing. For example, following our hearing on Cambridge Analytica, Facebook made significant changes to its privacy policies, and Facebook reformatted its privacy settings to make more accessible and user-friendly, eased the ability for its users to control and delete their information, took down malicious entities on its platform, and invested in programs to preserve and promote legitimate local news operations. And during that hearing, uh, Representative McKinley uh, actually pushed Mr. Zuckerberg pretty hard on some specific ads he'd seen illegally selling opioids without prescriptions on Facebook. And as a result, Facebook removed those ads. In fact, we got a call, I think as Mr. Zuckerberg was headed to the airport that afternoon, that those had already been taken down. Also notable, through the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have been working together to tackle terrorist content and importantly disrupt violent extremists' ability to promote themselves, share propaganda, and exploit digital platforms, and we thank you for that work. Now this is not to suggest the online ecosystem is perfect, it is far from it. Can these companies be doing more to clean up their platforms? Of course, and I expect them to, and I think you're all working on that, so let me be very clear. This hearing should serve as an important reminder to all online platforms that we're watching them closely. We want to ensure we do not harm innovation, but as we've demonstrated in a bipartisan fashion in the past, when we see issues or identify clear harms to consumers, we do not see online entities taking appropriate action. Uh, we are prepared to act. So, Madam Chair, thanks for having this hearing. Uh, this is tough stuff. I have a degree in journalism. I'm a big advocate of the First Amendment. And uh, it can be messy business uh, to, on the one hand, call on them to uh, take down things we don't like and still stay on the right side of the First Amendment. Because uh, vigorous speech, even when it's inaccurate, uh, is still protected in, under the First Amendment. And uh, if you go too far, then we yell at you for taking things down that we liked. Uh, and if you don't take down, 
things we don't like, then we yell at you for that. So you're kind of in a bit of a box, um, and yet we know 230 is an issue we need to, to revise and, and take a look at as well. And then speaking of a revise, I, I had to chuckle that um, we all get the opportunity to revise and extend our remarks uh, throughout this process and clean up our bad grammar. So maybe some of what we have is kind of fake reporting. But anyway, we'll leave that for another discussion on another day. And with that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Um, and um, the chair uh, would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written statement, opening statements shall be made part of the, uh, uh, of the record. Um, I would now like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Um, uh, Ms. Monica uh, Bickert, uh, Vice President of Global Policy Management at Facebook, I want to acknowledge and thank you, uh, Ms. Bickert. I know that you are not feeling well um, today and may want to abbreviate some of your testimony, but we thank you very much for coming anyway. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Joanne Donovan, um, Research Director of the Technology and Social Change Project at the Shorstein Center on Media Policy and Public Policy, uh, Politics and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, Mr. Justin Hurwitz, uh, Assistant Professor of Law and Director of NU Governance, uh, Governance and Technolo Technology Center at the University of Nebraska College of Law and Director of Law and Economics programs at the International Center for Law and Economics. And finally, um, Dr. Tristan Harris, who is Executive Director for the Center for Humane Technology. We want to um, thank our witnesses for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony at this time. Um, the chair will recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. Before we begin, I would just like to explain um, the lighting system for those who may not know it. In front of you is a, are a series of lights. Um, the lights will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn to yellow when you have one minute remaining. And if you could please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point, and then the light will turn red when your time has expired. So, Ms. Biggert, um, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky, Ranking Member McMorris-Rogers, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Monica Biggert. I'm the Vice President for Global Policy Management at Facebook, and I'm responsible for our content policies. Uh, as the Chairwoman pointed out, I'm a little under the weather today, so uh, with apologies, I'm gonna keep my remarks short, but uh, we'll rely on the written testimony I've submitted. We know that we have an important role to play at Facebook in addressing manipulation and deception on our platform. And we have many aspects to our approach, including our community standards, which specify what we will remove from the site, and our relationship with third-party fact checkers, through which fact checking organizations can rate content as false, we put a label over that content saying that this is false information and we reduce its distribution. Under the community standards, there are some types of misinformation that we remove, such as attempts to suppress the vote uh, or to interfere with the census. And we announced yesterday a new prong in our policy where we will also remove videos that are edited or synthesized using artificial intelligence or deep learning techniques in ways that are not apparent to the average person that would mislead the average person to believe that the subject of the video said something that he or she did not in fact say. To be clear, manipulated media that doesn't fall under this new policy definition is still subject to our other policies and our third party fact checking. That means that although deep fakes are still 
uh, an emerging technology, one area where internet experts um, have seen them is in nudity and pornography. All of that violates our policies against nudity and pornography, and we would remove it. Uh, manipulated videos are also eligible to, eligible to be fact-checked by these third-party uh, fact-checking organizations uh, that we work with to label and reduce the distribution of misinformation. We are always improving our policies and our enforcement, and we will continue to do the engagement we've done outside the company with academics and experts to understand the new ways that these technologies are emerging and affecting our community. We would also welcome the opportunity to collaborate with other industry partners and interested stakeholders, including academics, civil society, and lawmakers to help develop a consistent industry approach to these issues. Our hope is that by working together with all of these stakeholders, we can make faster progress in ways that benefit all of society. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, and um, now Dr. Donovan, you are recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, Chairwoman Schakowsky, Ranking Member McMorris-Rogers, Chairman Pallone, and Ranking Member Walden for having me today. It's truly an honor to be invited. Um, I lead a team at Harvard Kennedy Shorenstein Center that researches online manipulation and deception, and I've been a researcher of the internet for the last decade. Um, so. I know quite a bit about changes in policies as well as the development of platforms themselves and what they were intended to do. One of the things that I want to discuss today is online fraud, which is a great deal more widespread than, we, than many understand. Beyond malware, spam, and phishing attacks, beyond credit card scams and product knockoffs, there's a growing threat from new forms of identity fraud enabled by techno technological design. Platform companies are unable to manage this alone, and Americans need governance. Deception is now a multi-million dollar industry. My research team tracks dangerous individuals and groups who use social media to pose as political campaigns, social movements, news organizations, charities, brands, and even average people. This emerging economy of misinformation is a threat to national security. Silicon Valley corporations are largely profiting from it, while key political and social institutions are struggling to win back the public's trust. Platforms have done more than just given users a voice online. They've effectively given them the equivalent of their own broadcast station, emboldening the most malicious among us. To wreak havoc with, me with a media manipulation campaign, all one bad actor needs is motivation. Money also helps. But that's enough to create chaos and divert significant resources from civil society, politicians, newsrooms, healthcare providers, and even law enforcement who are tasked with repairing the damage. We currently do not know the true cost of misinformation. Individuals and groups can quickly weaponize social media, causing others financial and physical injury. For example, fraudsters using President Trump's image, name, logo, and voice have siphoned millions from his supporters by claiming to be part of his reelection coalition. In an election year, disinformation and donation scams should be of concern to everyone. Along with my co-researchers, Brian Friedman and Brandy Collins-Dexter, I've studied malicious groups, particularly white supremacists and foreign actors, who have used social media to inflame racial divisions. Even as these imposters are quickly identified by the communities they target, it takes time for platforms to remove inciting content. A single manipulation campaign can create an incredible strain on breaking news cycles, effectively turning many journalists into unpaid content moderators, in drawing law enforcement towards false leads. Today I argue that online communication technologies need regulatory guardrails to prevent them from being used for manipulative purposes. And in my written testimony, I've provided a longer list of uh, ways that you could uh, think about technology differently. But right now I'd like to call attention to deceptively edited audio and video to drive clicks, likes, and shares. This is the AI technology commonly referred to as deep fakes. And what I would also like to point out with my co-researcher, Britt Paris, that we've argued that cheap fakes are a wider threat. 
Like the doctored video of Speaker Pelosi, last week's decontextualized video of Joe Biden seemingly endorsing a white supremacist talking point poses another substantial challenge. Because the Biden video was clipped from non-augmented footage, platforms refused to take down this cheap fake. Millions have now seen it. Platforms like Radio Towers have provide amplification power, and as such, they have a public interest obligation. And I point out here that platforms are highly, decentra uh, highly centralized mechanisms of distribution, while the internet is not. So I'm not trying to conflate platforms with the internet. But this is why we place the burden of moderation on platforms and not with ISPs. The world online is the real world, and this crisis of counterfeits threatens to disrupt the way Americans live our lives. Right now, malicious actors jeopardize how we make informed decisions about who to vote for and what causes we support, while platform companies have designed systems that facilitate this manipulation. We must expand the public understanding of technology by guarding, against consumer, right, uh, guarding consumer rights against technological abuse, including a cross-sector effort to curb the distribution of harmful and malicious content. As Dana Boyd and I have written, platform companies must address the power of amplification and distribution separately from content so that media distribution is transparent and accountable. I urge Congress to do the same. Platforms have politics and regulation and technology must work in tandem or else the future is forgery. Thank you. Thank you, and now Mr. Hurwitz. Um, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairwoman, along with members of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. I would also be remiss if I did not thank my colleague, Christian Stout, and research assistant, Justin McCulley, for uh, help in drafting my written testimony. I am a law professor, so I apologize. I have written a short law review article for my written testimony, which I have assigned sure. to read. Uh, I will turn to discussing that. Make sure your mic, is your mic on? And I'll pull it up. There you okay. go. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I will turn to discussing the short <laughs> law review article that I've written for you as my testimony uh, and assigned you to read in a moment. Before I turn to that, I want to make a couple of book recommendations. If you really want to understand what's at stake with dark patterns, you should start by reading Brett Frischman and Evan Selinger's recent book, Reengineering Humanity. In my spare time, I'm a door-to-door -door book salesman. I have a copy here. Um, their book discusses how modern technology, data analytics, uh, combined with highly programmable environments, are creating a world in which people are, to use their term, programmable. This book will scare you. After you read that book, you should then read Cliff Kwong and Robert Fabricant's recent book, User Friendly. This was uh, just published in November. It discusses the importance and difficulty of designing technologies that seamlessly uh, operate in line with user expectations as user-friendly technologies. This book will help you understand the incredible power of user-friendly design and fill you with hope for what design makes possible, along with appreciation for how difficult it is to do design well. Together, these books will show you both sides of the coin. Dark patterns are something that this committee absolutely should be concerned about, but this committee should also approach the topic with great caution. Design is powerful, but it is incredibly difficult to do well. Efforts to regulate bad uses of design could easily harm efforts to do and use design for good. How's that for having a professor testify? I've already assigned two books and a law review article of my own for you to read. I'll do what I can uh, to summarize some of the key ideas uh, from that article uh, in the next uh, three minutes or so. Dark pattern is an ominous term. It is itself a dark pattern. It's a term for a simple concept. People behave in predictable ways. These behavioral patterns can be used to program us in certain ways. And the concern is that sometimes we can be programmed to act against our own self-interest. So I have some examples. If we can uh, look at the first example, this is something from the internet. If you look at this for a moment, who here feels manipulated by this image? It's OK to say, yes, I do. Um, the designer of this image is using uh, his knowledge of how people read text in an image to make it feel like the image is controlling us, making us control how our eyes are following it and predicting where we're going to go next. Weird stuff. Let's look at another example. Again, you can definitely tell from the internet. Again, who feels like this image is manipulative? 
The image, uh, the previous image was harmless, but this one hints at the darker pattern, power of dark patterns. Most of you probably missed the typos in the first line and then the second line until the text pointed them out to you. What if this had been a contract and this trick was used to insert a material term or distract you from a material term in the contract that you were agreeing to? This has now gone from weird stuff to scary stuff. On the other hand, these same tricks can be used for good. In this same example, what if uh, this trick were used to highlight an easily missed but important concern for consumers to pay attention to? This could be beneficial to consumers. Design is not mere aesthetics. All design influences how decisions are made. It is not possible to regulate bad design with also, without also affecting good design. So how much of a problem are dark patterns? Recent research, research shows that websites absolutely are using them, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly, to influence users. And other research shows us that these tactics can be effective, leading consumers to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. We've already heard some of examples of these, so I won't repeat what's already been discussed. Rather, I'd like to leave you with a few ideas about what, if anything, we should do about them. First, dark patterns are used both online and offline. Stores use their floor plans to influence what people buy. Advertisers make consumers feel a sense of need and urgency for products. Try canceling a subscription service or returning a product. You'll likely be routed through a maddening maze of consumer service res representatives. If these patterns are a problem online, they are a problem offline too. We shouldn't focus on one to the exclusion of the other. Second, while these tricks are annoying, it's unclear how much they actually harm consumers or how much benefit they may confer. Studies of mandatory disclosure laws, for instance, find that they have limited effectiveness. On the other hand, these tricks can also be used to benefit consumers. We should be cautious with regulations that may fail to stop bad conduct while reducing the benefits of good conduct. Third, most of the worst examples of dark patterns very likely fall within the FTC's authority to regulate deceptive acts or practices. Before the legislature takes any action to address these concerns, the FTC should attempt to use its existing authority to address them. It's already hearing, uh, having hearings on this, uh, uh, these issues. If this proves ineffective, the FTC should report to you, to Congress, on these practices. Fourth, industry has been responsive to these issues and to some extent has been self-regulating. Web browsers and operating systems have made many bad design practices harder to use. Design prof professionals scorn dark patterns as uh, practices. Industry standardization and best practices and self-regulations should be encouraged. Fifth, regulators should, yes, um, uh, last uh, and building on all of the above, this is an area well suited to cooperation between industry and regulators. Efforts at self-regulation should be encouraged and rewarded. Perhaps even more important, given the complexity of these systems, industry should be at the front line of combating them. Industry has greater design expertise and ability to experiment than regulators, but there's an important role for regulation to step in where industry fails to police itself. In a true professor fashion, thank you, I look forward to uh, discussion. Mr. Harris, you are recognized now for, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Jakowski and, and members. Really appreciate you inviting me here. Um, I'm gonna go off script. I, I come here because I'm incredibly concerned. Um, I actually have a lifelong experience with deception and how technology influences people's minds. Uh, I was a magician as a kid, so I've started off by seeing the world this way. And then I studied at a lab called the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, actually with the founders of Instagram. And so I know the culture of the people who build these products and the way that it's designed intentionally for mass deception. I think there's a, the thing I most want to respond to here is we, we've often framed these issues as we've got a few bad apples. We've got these bad deep fakes, we've got to get them off the platform. We've got this bad content, we've got these bad bots. What I want to argue is this is actually, not, and we've got these dark patterns. What I want to argue is we have dark infrastructure. This is now the infrastructure by which 2.7 billion people, bigger than the size of Christianity, make sense of the world. It's the, it's the information environment. And if someone went along, private companies, and built nuclear power plants and uh, all across the United States, and they started melting down, and, and they said, well, it's your responsibility to have hazmat suits and build, you know, have a radiation kit, that's essentially what we're experiencing now. The responsibility is being put on, on consumers when, in fact, if it's the infrastructure, it should be put on the people building that infrastructure. Um, 
there's specifically two areas of harm I want to focus on, even though when this becomes the infrastructure, it controls all of our lives. So we wake up with these devices, we check our phones 150 times a day, it's the infrastructure for going to bed, children spend as much time on these devices as they do at the hours of school. So no matter what you're putting in people's brains, kids' brains at school, you've got all the hours they spend it, uh, you know, in their phones. Uh, and well, let's take the kids issue. So as infrastructure, this is not, the business model of this infrastructure is not aligned with the fabric of society. How much have you paid for your Facebook account recently? Or your YouTube account? Zero. How are they worth more than a trillion dollars of market value? They monetize our attention. The way they get that attention is by influencing you and getting, using these dark patterns or tricks to do it. So the way they do it with children is they say, how many likes or followers do you have? So they basically get children addicted to getting attention from other people. They use filters, likes, et cetera, et cetera beautification filters that enhance your self-image. And after two decades in decline, the mental health of teen girls, high depressive symptoms, there's an image here that they'll be able to show, uh, went up 170% after the year 2010 with the rise of Instagram, et cetera. Okay? These are your children. These are your constituents. This is a real mm. issue. Mm. It's because we're hacking the self-image of children. On the information ecology front, the business model, think of it like we're drinking from the Flint water supply of information. This is the, the business model is polarization because the whole point is I have to figure out and calculate whatever keeps your attention, which means affirmation, not information, by default. It polarizes us by default. There's a recent upturn study that um, it actually costs more money to advertise across the aisle than it does to advertise to people with your own same beliefs. In other words, polarization has a home field advantage in terms of the business model. The natural function of these, of these platforms is to reward conspiracy theories, outrage, what we call the race to the bottom of the brainstem. It's the reason why all of you at home have crazier and crazier constituents who believe crazier and crazier things, and you have to respond to them. And I know you don't like that. Um, Russia is manipulating our veterans. by go We have totally open borders while we've been protecting our, digital, our physical borders. We left the digital border wide open. Imagine a nuclear plant who said, we're not going to actually protect the nuclear plants from Russian cyber attacks. Well, this is sort of like Facebook building the, in the information infrastructure and not protecting it from any uh, bad actors until that pressure is there. And this is leading to a kind of information trust meltdown because no one even has to use deep fakes for essentially people to say, well, that must be a faked video, right? So we're actually at the last turning point, kind of an event horizon, where we either protect the, the foundations of our information and trust environment, or we let it go away. And you know, we say we care about kids' education, but we allow you know, technology companies to, to basically tell them that uh, the world revolves around likes, clicks, and shares. We say we want to uh, you know, come together, but we allow technology to profit by dividing us into echo chambers. We say America should lead on the global stage against China with a strong economy, but we allow technology companies to degrade our productivity and mental health while jeopardizing the development of our future workforce, which is our children. Um, and so while I'm finishing up here, I just want to say uh, that instead of trying to design some new federal agency, some master agency, when technology has basically taken all the laws of the physical world, uh, taken all the infrastructure of the physical world and virtualized it into a virtual world with no laws, what happens when you have no laws for an entire virtualized infrastructure? You can't just bring some new agency around and regulate all of the virtual world. Why don't we take the existing infrastructure, existing agencies, who already have purview, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, National Institute of Health, and have a digital update that expands their jurisdiction to just ask, well, how do we protect the tech platforms in the, in the same areas of jurisdiction? Uh, I know I'm out of time, so thank, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have uh, concluded our witnesses' opening statements. At this time, we will move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask a question of our witnesses. Um, I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Okay. Oh, I see. Um, so as, uh, as chair of the subcommittee, over and over again, I'm confronted with uh, new evidence that big tech has failed in regulating itself. Um, when we had Mark Zuckerberg here, I kind of did a uh, review of all the apologies that we've had uh, from him over, over the years. And I'm concerned 
that uh, Facebook latest effort to um, address misinformation on the platforms um, leaves a lot out. Um, I want to um, begin with uh, some questions of you, Ms. Ms. Biggert. Um, so the, the deep fakes policy only covers video, as I understand it, um, that have been manipulated using artificial intelligence or deep learning. Is that correct? Thank you, Chairwoman Schakowsky. The policy that we announced yesterday is confined to uh, the definition that, that we set forth about artificial intelligence being used in a video to make it appear that somebody is saying Okay, so I, I only have five minutes. So the, uh, the, the video, for example, of Speaker Pelosi um, was edited to make her look like she was drunk, um, wouldn't have been taken down under the new policy. Is that right? Yes or no? It would not fall under that policy, but it would still be subject to our um, other policies that address misinformation. And as I read the uh, deepfakes policy, it only covers video um, where a person is made to appear like they said words that they didn't actually say. But it doesn't cover um, videos where just the image is altered. Is that true? Uh, Jerome Jakowski, there are, th that is correct about that policy. We do have a broader approach to misinformation that would put a label, we would actually obscure the image and put um, a screen over it that says false information and directs people to information from fact checkers. Um, so, M Ms. Bigard, I, I really don't understand why Facebook should treat fake audio uh, differently from fake images. Both can be highly misleading. Um, and result in significant harm to individuals and undermine democratic institutions. Um, Dr. Um, Donovan, in your testimony, you noted that, quote, cheap fakes, unquote, are more prevalent than deep fakes. Do you see any reason to treat deep fakes as, and cheat fakes differently? Microphone. Of course, um, as if I'm not loud enough. Um, one of the things that is uh, cheap fakes leverage is what's sort of great about social media is that it makes things uh, clippier or smaller. And so th I understand the need for separate policies, but also the cheap fakes issue has not been enforced, um, n not just uh, speaking more broadly about social media platforms in general. There's completely uneven enforcement, so you can still find that piece of misinformation within the wrong context um, in multiple places. And so the policy on deep fakes is both narrow, uh, and I understand why, but also one thing that we should understand is presently there is no um, consistent detection mechanism for even finding deep fakes at this point. And so I'd be interested to know more about how they are going to seek out either on upload, uh, not just Facebook, but I'm going to have to uh, cut you off this point because I do want to ask Mr. Harris. Um, given the prevalence of deceptive content online, um, are platforms doing enough to stop the dissemination of misinformation? And what can government do to prevent such manipulation of consumers? Should government be seeking to clarify the principle that if it's illegal offline, then it's illegal online? Yes, a good example of that. So first is, no, the platforms are not doing enough, and it's because their entire business model is misaligned with solving the problem. And I don't vilify the people because of that. It's just their business model is against the, the issue. Uh, we used to have Saturday morning cartoons. We protected children from certain kinds of advertising, time, place, manner restrictions. When YouTube, for, when YouTube gobbles up that part of the attention economy, we lose all those protections. So why not bring back the protections of Saturday morning? used to have fair price, equal price election ads on TV, the same price for each politician to reach someone. When Facebook gobbles up election advertising, we just removed all of those same protections. So we're basically moving from a lawful society to an unlawful virtual internet society. And that's what we have to change. Thank you. I, uh, I yield back. I 
Now the chair recognizes Ms. Rogers, our subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I referenced how misinformation is not a new problem, but certainly with the speed of information, how it can travel in the online world, its, it's harm is increasing. That said, I've long believed that the way to address information is more transparency, more sources, more speech, not less. This is important, not just in an election cycle, but also in discussions around public health issues, natural disasters, or any number of significant events. I'm worried about this renewed trend where some want the government to set the parameters and potentially limit speech and expression. Ms. Bickert, how does free speech and expression factor into Facebook's content decisions? And can you please explain your use of third-party fact checkers? Thank you. We are very much a platform for free expression. Um, it's one of the reasons that we work with third-party fact-checking organizations because what we do if they've ranked something false is we share more information on the service. So we put a label over it. This is false information. But then we show people, here's what fact-checkers are saying about this story. Uh, we work with more than 50 organizations worldwide, uh, and the, those uh, organizations are chosen after meeting high standards for fact-checking. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up with the total volume of traffic you have, clearly human eyes alone can't keep up. So artificial intelligence and machine learning have a significant role to identify not only deep fakes, but also other content that violates your terms of service. Would you just explain a little bit more to us um, how you use AI and the potential to use AI to fight fire with fire? Absolutely. Uh, we do use a combination of technology and people to identify potential information to send to fact checkers. Uh, we also use people and technology to try to assess whether or not something has been manipulated media uh, that would be covered by the policy we released yesterday. So with the fact checking program, we use technology to look for things like, um, let's say somebody has shared an image or a news story and people, our friends are commenting on that saying, don't you know this is a hoax or this isn't true? That's the sort of thing our technology can spot and send that content over to fact checkers. But it's not just technology. We also have ways for people to flag if they are seeing something that they believe to be false. That can send content over to fact checkers and then the fact checkers can also proactively uh, choose to rate something that they are seeing on Facebook. Thank you. Uh, Professor Hurwitz, can you briefly describe how user interfaces can be designed to shape consumer choice and how such designs may benefit or harm consumers? Uh, they can be used, uh, they can be modified, created, structured in any number of ways. Uh, we've heard examples, uh, font size, text placement, um, uh, the course of interaction with a website, or even just a, a phone menu system. Uh, these can be used to guide users into making uninformed decisions or to highlight information that users should be paying attention to. This broadly falls into the category of nudges in behavioral psychology. Um, that's an uh, intensely researched area. It can be used in many ways. Right, and you highlighted some of that in your testimony. Would you explain how the FTC can use its existing Section 5 authority to address most of the concerns raised by dark pattern Practices? Uh, yes, uh, very briefly. Um, I, I could lecture for a semester on this, not to say that I have. Um, uh, the FTC has a broad history, long history of uh, regulating unfair and deceptive practices and advertising practices. Uh, it's deception authority, false uh, uh, statements, uh, statements that are uh, material to a consumer making a decision that is harmful to the consumer. Uh, they can use adjudication, uh, they can uh, enact rules. Um, in order to take action against uh, platforms or any entity, online or offline, that deceives consumers. Do you think that they're doing enough? Uh, I would love to see the FTC do more in this area, especially when it comes to rulemaking and in-court enforcement actions, because the boundaries of their authority are unknown, uncertain, untested. Um, this is an area where uh, bringing suits, bringing litigation, that tells us what the agency is capable of, which this body needs to know before it tries to craft more legislation or give uh, more authority to an entity. If we already have an agency that has power, let's see if, what it's capable of. Right, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all being here. Very important subject, and appreciate the chair for hosting or 
having this hearing today. I thank the ranking member who yields back, and now I recognize the um, chair of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a lot to ask here, so I'm going to ask you for your responses to be brief if possible. But in your various testimonies, you all talked about a variety of technologies and techniques that are being used to deceive and manipulate consumers. We've heard about user interfaces designed to persuade and sometimes trick people into making certain choices, deep fakes and cheap fakes that show fictional scenarios that look real, and algorithms designed to keep people's eyes locked on their screens. And we know these things are happening. But what's less clear is how and the extent to which these techniques are being used commercially and on commercial platforms. So first let me ask uh, Dr. Donovan, as a researcher who focuses on the use of these techniques, do you have sufficient access to commercial platform data to have a comprehensive understanding of how disinformation and fraud is conducted and by whom? Your, yeah, your mic. Um, the brief answer is no, and that's because uh, we don't have um, access to the data as it is. There's all these limits on the ways in which you can acquire data um, through the interface. And then the other problem is that there was a very good faith effort between Facebook and and scholars to try to get uh, a bunch of data related to the 2016 election that fell apart, but a lot of people put an incredible amount of time, money, and energy into that effort, and it failed around the issues related to privacy and differential privacy. Um, what I would love to see also happen is uh, Twitter has started to give data related to deletions and account takedowns, we need a record of that so that when we do audit these platforms for either financial or social harms, that the deletions are also included and marked. Because even if you can act like a data scavenger and go back and get data, when things are deleted, sometimes they're just gone for good. And those pieces of information are often the most crucial. Thank you. Mr. Harris, should the government be collecting more information about such practices in order to determine how best to protect Americans? Uh, yes, here, here's an example. So um, uh, unlike other addictive industries, for example, addiction is part of the deception uh, that's going on here. Uh, the tobacco industry doesn't know which users are addicted to smoking. The, the alcohol industry doesn't know exactly who's addicted to alcohol. But unlike that, each tech company does know exactly how many people are checking more than you know, 100 times a day between certain ages. They know who's using it late at night. And you can imagine using existing agencies, say Department of Health and Human Services, to be able to uh, audit Facebook on a quarterly basis and say, hey, tell us how many users are addicted between these ages. And then what are you doing next quarter to make adjustments to reduce that number? And every day, they're the ones issuing the questions, and the responsibility and the resources have to be deployed by the actor that has the most of them, which in this case would be Facebook. And there's a quarterly loop between each agency asking questions like that forcing accountability with the companies for the areas of their existing jurisdiction. So I'm just trying to figure out, is that a way that we can scale this to meet the scope of the problem when you realize this is happening to 2.7 billion people? Thank you. This week, Facebook released a new policy on how it will handle deep fakes. So Ms. Pickard, under your policy, deep fakes are, and I'm paraphrasing, videos manipulated through artificial intelligence that intended to mislead and are not parody or satire. Did I get that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, I understand that Twitter and YouTube either do not have or use the same definition for deep fakes, and that's indicative, indicative of a lack of consistent treatment of problematic content across the major platforms. Banned hate speech or abusive behavior on one side is permitted on another. There seems to be very little consistency across the marketplace, which leaves consumers at a loss. So let me go to Dr. Donovan again. Is there a way to develop a common set of standards for these problematic practices so that consumers are not facing different policies on different websites? Your mic again. I got it. Um, I, I think it's possible to create a set of policies, but you have to look at the, the features that are uh, consistent across these platforms. If they do, for instance, uh, use attention to a specific post in their algorithms to boost popularity, then we need a regulation around that, especially because 
bots or unmanned accounts, for lack of a better term, are often used to accelerate content and to move content across platforms. These are things that are usually purchased off-platform and they are considered a, a dark market product, but you can purchase attention to an issue. And so as a result, there has to be something more broad that goes across platforms but also looks at the features and, uh, and then also tries to regulate some of these markets that are not built into the platform themselves. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Bouchon, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Sorry, I have two of these hearings going on at the same time, so I'm back and forth. Uh, I appreciate the hearing and uh, the opportunity to discuss the spread of misinformation on the Internet, but I want to stress that I'm, I am concerned over the efforts to make tech companies the adjudicators of truth, in quotation marks. In a country founded on free speech, we should not be allowing uh, private corporations, in my view, or for that matter, the government, uh, to determine what qualifies as the, and again, in quotation marks, the truth, potentially censoring a voice because that voice disagrees with mainstream opinion. That said, I totally understand the difficulty and the challenges that we all face together uh, in, concerning this issue and how we're together trying to work to address it. Uh, Ms. Bickert, can you provide uh, some more information on how Facebook uh, might or will determine if a video misleads? What factors might you consider? Thank you. Uh, just to be clear, there are two ways that we might be looking at that issue. Uh, one is with regard to the deep fakes policy that we released yesterday. Um, and we will be looking to see specifically uh, what type of tech, were, were we seeing artificial intelligence and deep learnings, was that part of the technology that was uh, uh, led to change or fabricate a video in a way that really wouldn't be evident to the average person? And, and that will be a fundamental part of determining whether there's misleading. Separately- Can I, can I ask a question then? <coughs> who's, who's the average- <coughs> Sorry, I'll wait till you quit coughing cough, so you can sorry. hear me. Uh, um, the question then, I mean, I'm playing devil's advocate here, who's the average person? No, Congressman, these are exactly the questions that uh, we've been discussing with more than 50 experts as we've tried right. to, to write this policy and get it in the right, right place. And I appreciate uh, what you're doing. I'm not trying to be difficult here. No, we, these, are, these are real challenging issues. It's one of the reasons that uh, we think generally the approach to misinformation of getting more information out there from accurate sources okay. um, is effective. And you stated in your testimony that once a fact checker rates a photo or video as false or partly false, Facebook reduces the distribution. Is there a way for an individual who may have posted these things to protest the decision? Uh, yes, Congressman. They can go directly to the fact checker. We make sure there's a mechanism for that. And they can do that either if they dispute it or if they have amended whatever it was in their, in their article that was the problem. Right, because I, I would say, I mean, people with good lawyers can dispute a lot things, but the average citizen in southwest Indiana who posts something online, it, it, there needs to be, a, in my view, uh, a, a fairly straightforward process that the average person, uh, whoever that might be, can understand to protest or, or, or dispute the fact that uh, the, their distribution has been reduced. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurwitz, you, you have discussed that the FTC is current authority to address dark pattern. However, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on how consumers can protect themselves from these patterns and advertisements. Is the only solution through government action or can the con con consumer education help highlight these advertisement practices? Um, the most important thing for any company, especially in the uh, online context, is trust, the trust of the consumers. Um, consumer education, user education is important, but uh, I, I think that it's fair to say with uh, uh, condolences perhaps to uh, uh, Ms. Bickert, Facebook has a trust problem. If consumers, if users stop trusting these platforms, if hearings such as this shine a light on bad practices, um, then they're going to have a hard time retaining uh, uh, users and consumers. That puts a great deal of pressure. In addition, uh, stability of practices. Um, if we have... 
one dark pattern is to constantly change the user interface. So users don't know how it operates. If we have stability, if we have platforms that operate in consistent, predictable ways, that helps users become educated, helps users understand uh, what the practices are, and learn how to operate in this new environment. Trust on the internet is different. Okay. We're still learning what it means. And I know you went over this, but can you talk again about how these dark pattern practices took place before the internet? And, uh, and are currently happening uh, in brick and mortar stores and other areas, mail pieces that politicians send out. I mean, I just want to make, uh, reiterate again, this is a broader problem than just the internet. This is something that's been around for a while. Yeah, the dark patterns, these practices, they go back to the beginning of time. Basic, fundamentally, they're persuasion. Um, if I want to convince you of my worldview, if I want to convince you to be my customer, if I want to convince you to be my friend, I'm going to do things that influence you. I'm going to present myself to you in ways that are going to try and get you to like me or my product. Um, if you come into uh, my store and ask for a recommendation, uh, what size tire do I need for my car? My sales representative is going to give you information. Okay. The store is going to be structured. Uh, these have been used yeah. consistently throughout. My, my time has expired. My point was, it was is that we, when we look at this problem, we need to take a whole, in my view, take a holistic approach about what's happened in the past and with emerging technology, how we address that consistently and not just target specific industries. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Congresswoman Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Chikowsky, for calling this hearing. You know, the internet and online platforms have developed over time without a lot of safeguards for the public. And uh, Government here, we exercise our responsibility to keep the public safe, whether it's the cars we drive, the water we drink, airplanes, um, drugs that are for sale, and really the same should apply to um, the internet and online platforms. Uh, you know, there is a lot of illegal activity uh, being promoted online where the First Amendment just does not come into play, and I hope we don't go down that rabbit hole because we're talking about human trafficking, uh, terrorist plots, illicit sales of firearms, child exploitation. Uh, and now what we have swamping these online platforms that control the algorithms that manipulate the public are the deep fakes, these dark patterns, uh, artificial intelligence, identity theft. Uh, but these online platforms, remember, they control these algorithms that that steer children and adults, everyone, in certain directions. And we've got to get a handle on that. Uh, for example, Mr. Harris, one manipulative design technique uh, is the autoplay feature. It's now ubiquitous across video streaming platforms, uh, particularly billions of people that go onto YouTube or, or Facebook, this feature automatically begins playing a new video after the current video ends. The next video is determined using an algorithm which is designed to keep the viewer's attention. This platform-driven algorithm drives, often drives the proliferation of illegal activities and, and, and dangerous ideologies and conspiracy theories, makes it much more difficult for the average person to to try to get truth-based content. I'm particularly concerned about the impact on kids, and you've raised that, and I appreciate that. Uh, you discuss how the mental health of uh, kids today really is at risk. Uh, can you talk more about the context in which children may be particularly harmed by these addiction-maximizing algorithms and what parents can do to protect kids from becoming trapped in the YouTube vortex and what you believe our responsibility is, is as policymakers. Thank you so much for your, for your question. Yeah, this is very deeply concerning to me. So um, laying it out, um, with more than 2 billion users, think of these on YouTube as 2 billion Truman shows. Each of you get a channel and a supercomputer is just trying to calculate the perfect thing to confirm your view of reality. This, by definition, fractures reality into two billion different polarizing channels, each of which is tuned to bring you to a more extreme view. A quick example is, imagine a spectrum of all the videos on YouTube laid out on one line, and on my left side over here, you have the calm Walter Cronkite rational science side of YouTube, and on the other side, you have crazy town. You have UFOs, conspiracy theories, 
Alex Jones, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, no matter where you start, if I'm YouTube, you could start in the calm section or you could start in crazy. If I want you to watch more, am I gonna steer you that way or that way? I'm always gonna steer you towards crazy town. So imagine taking the ant colony of 2.1 billion humans and then just tilting it like that. Three examples of that per your kid's example. Two years ago on YouTube, if a teen girl watched a dieting video, it would autoplay anorexia videos because those were more extreme. If you watched um, a 9-11 news video, it would recommend 9-11 conspiracy theories. If you watched the uh, videos about the moon landing, it would recommend flat earth conspiracy theories. Flat earth conspiracy theories were recommended hundreds of millions of times. This might sound just funny and oh, look at those people, but actually this is very serious. I have a researcher friend who studied this. If the flat earth theory is true, it means not just that all of government is lying to you, but all of science is lying to you. So think about that for a second. That's like a meltdown of all of our rational epistemic understanding of the world. And as you said, um, these things are autoplaying. So the autoplay is just like a, it, it, it hacks your brain's stopping cue. So as a magician, how do I know if I want you to stop? I put a stopping cue in, your mind wakes up. It's like a right angle and a choice. If I stop drinking, if the water hits the bottom of the glass, I have to make a conscious choice. Do I want more? But we can design it so it just, the bowl never stops. We can just keep refilling the water and you never, you never stop. And that's how we basically have kept millions of kids addicted. In places like the Philippines, people watch YouTube for 10 hours a day. And this has, this has significant cost to the public, and that's, that's the, one of the points I hope people will understand, as Dr. Donovan says, there's economy of misinformation now. These online platforms now are passing along, that they're monetizing, making billions of dollars. Meanwhile, public health costs, law enforcement costs are adding up to, to the public, and we have a real responsibility to tackle, tackle this and level the playing field. And by not acting, we're subsidizing our societal self-destruction. I mean, we're subsidizing that right now. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I recognize uh, Representative Burgess for five minutes. And thank you. Thanks for, thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, apologize. We have another health hearing going on upstairs, so it's uh, one of those days you've got to toggle between important, uh, important issues. Uh, Mr. Hurwitz, let me uh, start by asking you, uh, and this is a little bit off topic, but it's important. In 2018, the United States District Court for Western Pennsylvania indicted seven Russians for conducting a physical cyber hacking, hacking operation in 2016 against Western targets, including the United States Anti-Doping Agency in response to the revelation of Russia's state-sponsored doping campaign. These hackers were members of the Russian military, the GRU. Uh, according to the indictment, the stolen information was publicized by the GRU as part of a related influence and disinformation campaign designed to undermine the legitimate interests of the victims. This information included personal medical information about United States athletes. So these GRU hackers used fictitious identities and fake social media accounts to research and probe victims and their computer networks, while the methods we're talking about today are largely in the context of perhaps deceiving voters or consumers, and the harmful potential for potential effects is actually quite large. So in your testimony, you, you defined the dark pattern as the practice of using design to prompt desired, if not necessarily desirable, behavior. Can these dark patterns be used to surveil people and find ways to hack them in the service of broader state-sponsored operations? Uh, yes, absolutely they can, and this goes to the broader context in which this discussion is happening. We're not only talking about consumer protection, um, we're talking about a fundamental architecture. The nature, as I said before, of trust online is different. All of those cues that we rely on for you to know who I am when you see me sitting here, we've gone through some vetting process to be sitting here. We have identities. Um, we have telltale cues that you can rely on to know who I am and who you are. Those are different online. Um, and we need to think about trust online differently. Uh, one uh, uh, point, one example that I'll highlight uh, that goes to uh, a industry-based solution um, and more important, 
the nature of how we need to think about these things differently um, in the context of uh, targeted advertising and uh, political advertising in particular. How do we deal with targeted misinformation for political ads? Well, one approach which Facebook has been experimenting with is instead of saying you can't speak, you can't advertise, if I target an ad at a group of speakers, Facebook will let someone else target an ad to that same group where they've been experimenting with this. It's a different way of thinking about how we deal with establishing trust or responding to untrustworthy information. We need more creative thinking. We need more research about how do we establish trust in the online environment. Well, thank you, and thank you for those observations, Ms. Baker. Uh, if I ever doubted the power of Facebook three years ago, that doubt was completely eliminated. Um, one of your representatives actually offered to do a Facebook event in the district that I represent in Northern Texas, and it was not a political, it was a business to business. It's how, you know, to, how to facilitate and run your small business more efficiently, and wanted to do a program, and we selected a Tuesday morning, and I asked how big a venue should we get, thinking maybe 20, 30, and I was told 2,000. Expect 2,000 people to show up. And I'm like, 2,000 people on a Tuesday morning for a business-to-business -business Facebook presentation? Are you nuts? The place was standing room only. And it was the power of Facebook getting the word out there that this is what we're doing. And it was one of the most well-attended events I've, I've ever been to as an elected representative. So if I'd ever doubted the power of Facebook, it was certainly brought home to me uh, how just exactly the, the kind of equity that you're able to wield. But recognizing that, um, do you have a sense of the type of information on your platforms that needs to be fact-checked because you do have such a, an enormous amount of equity? Yes, Congressman, and, and uh, thank you for those words. Uh, we're concerned not just with misinformation. That is a concern, and that's why we developed the uh, relationships we have now with more than 50 fact-checking organizations but we're also concerned with abuse of any time type. I'm responsible for managing that, so whether it's terror propaganda, hate speech, threats of violence, child exploitation content, content that promotes eating disorders, any of that violates our policies and we go after it proactively to try to find it and remove it. That's what my team does. Do you feel you've been successful? Uh, I think we have had a lot of successes and we're making huge strides. Uh, there's always more to do. We've begun publishing reports in the past year and a half or so every six months where we actually show across different abuse types, how prevalent is this on Facebook from, from doing a sample? How much content did we find this quarter and, and remove? And how much did we find before anybody reported it to us? The numbers are, are uh, trending in a good direction in terms of how effective our enforcement uh, measures are, and we hope that will continue to improve. As policymakers, can we access that, that fund of data to say, for example, get the number of anti-vaccine uh, issues that have been propagated on your platform. Congressman, I can follow up with you on um, the reports we have and, and uh, any other information. Thank you, I'll yield back. If I could just clarify that question, is that information readily available to consumers or no? Uh, Chairwoman, the reports I just mentioned are publicly available and we can follow up with any uh, detailed requests as well. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Vesey. Um, I recognize Mr. Vesey for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, outside of self-reporting, what can be done to help educate um, uh, uh, communities that may uh, be specifically targeted by, uh, you know, on these different platforms? I, I was wondering, Mr. Harris, if you could ad address that specifically, just because I think that uh, a, a, a great deal of my constituency, and, and and even on the Republican side, I think a great deal of their constituencies are probably being targeted based on things like race and income, religion, and what have you. And is there anything outside of self-reporting that can be done to, to, to just help educate people more? Yeah, there's, there's so many things here. Um, and as you mentioned, um, in the 2016 election, Russia targeted African-American populations. I think people don't realize, um, I, I think every time a campaign is discovered, how do we back notify people, uh, all of whom were affected, and say, 
you were the target of an influence operation. So right now, every single week, we hear reports of Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, uh, Israel, China, Russia, all doing various different influence operations. Russia was recently going after US veterans. Many veterans would probably say that's a conspiracy theory, right? But Facebook is the company that knows exactly who was affected. And they could actually back notify every time there's an influence operation, letting those, those communities know that this is what happened and that they were targeted. We have to move from this is a conspiracy theory to this is real. I, I've studied cult deprogramming for a while. And how do you um, wake people up from a cult when they, they don't know they're in? You have to show them essentially the techniques that were used on them to manipulate them. And every single time these operations happen, I think that has to be made visible to people. And just like we said, you know, we have laws and protections. We have a Pentagon to protect our physical borders. We don't have a Pentagon to protect our digital borders. And so we depend on however many people Facebook chooses to hire uh, for, for those teams. Uh, one example of this, by the way, is that the city of Los Angeles uh, spends 25% of its budget on security. Uh, Facebook spends 6% of its budget on security. So it's underspending the city of LA by about four times. So you, know, you can just make some benchmarks and say, are they solving the problem? They've got 2.2 billion fake accounts, Facebook has, that they took down, fake accounts. So they have 2.7 billion real accounts, and then there was 2.2 billion fake accounts. And um, you know, you, I'm sure they got all of them, I think would be the line to, to use here. Uh, Ms. Bickert, uh, you know, given the fact that it does seem like these foreign agents, these foreign actors are targeting people specifically by their race, uh, by their economics, by what regions of the country uh, that they live in, is Facebook doing anything to, uh, uh, to, to gather information or to uh, look at, at how specific groups are being targeted? If, if African Americans are being targeted for political misinformation, if, if whites that live in uh, rural America, uh, if they're being targeted for political misinformation, if people based on their likes, like if you could gather information, if these foreign actors could gather uh, uh, information based on people, based on things that they like. So let's say that you were, you, you were white and you lived in rural America and you liked One America News and you liked uh, these other things and you may be more likely to be to believe in these sorts of conspiracy theories? Like, are, are, are you sure that some of the things that people are sharing uh, on your platform, the likes and dislikes, aren't, aren't being used as part of that scheme as well? Could you just, could you answer both of those? Yes, Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. There are, broadly speaking, two things that we do. Uh, one is trainings and tools to help people, especially those who might be most at risk, recognize ways to keep themselves safe from everything from hacking to uh, scams and other abuse. Separately, whenever we remove influence operations under our, what we call this coordinated inauthentic behavior, we've removed more than 50 such networks in the past year. Anytime we do that, we're very public about it because we want to expose exactly what we're seeing. And we'll even include examples in our post um, saying, here's a network, it was in this country, it was targeting people in this other country. Here are examples of the types of posts that they were putting in their pages. We think the more we can shine a light on this, the more we'll be able to stop it. But, but before my time expires, but if people are being specifically, <laughs> if, if there are whites in Dr. Burgess's district being specifically targeted because of certain television or news programming that they like, if there are African Americans that are being specifically uh, targeted because uh, Russian actors may think that they lean a certain way in politics. Don't you think that information uh, ought to be analyzed more closely instead of relying on, 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 on um, instead of just leaving it up to the, to, to the user to be able to figure all of this out? Especially when people work odd hours and, and may only have time to, to, um, uh, to, to digest what they immediately read and they may not have an opportunity to go back in and analyze something so deeply as far as what you're saying. Congressman, I uh, appreciate that. And uh, I will say attribution is, is complicated and understanding the intent behind uh, some of these operations is complicated. We think the best way to do that is to make them public. And we don't just, uh, we don't just uh, do this ourselves. We actually work hand in hand with academics and security firms who are studying these types of things so that they can see, and sometimes we'll say as we take down a, a network, we have done this in uh, collaboration or conversation with, and we will name the group. So there are groups 
who can look at this and, and uh, together hopefully shine light on who the actors are and why they're doing what they're doing. Thank you. you back. Recognize Mr. Latta for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks very much for holding this very important hearing today. And thank you to our witnesses for appearing before us. And uh, it's really important uh, for Americans to get this information. In 2018, the experts out there estimated that criminals were successful in stealing over $37 billion from our older Americans through different scams through the internet, identity theft, friends, family abuse, and imposter schemes. And last year in my district, uh, I had the Federal Trade Commission and the uh, IRS out for a, uh, a senior event so that uh, seniors could uh, be educated on the threat of these scams and how to recognize, avoid, ward off, and how to recover from them. Congress recognized that many of these scams were carried out through the use of manipulative and illegal robocalls to combat these uh, scams. I introduced the Stop Robocalls Act, which was recently signed into law as part of the uh, TRACE Act, which I'm very glad the President signed over the Christmas holiday. Well, I'm glad that we were able to get this done. I continue to be concerned with the ability of scammers to evolve and adapt to changes in the law by utilizing new technologies and techniques like deep and cheap fakes. And uh, uh, Ms. Bickard, I don't want to uh, uh, pick on you, and I really appreciate uh, you being here today, especially since you're a little under the weather. And uh, I also appreciated reading your testimony last night. Yeah, I, thought, I found it very interesting and enlightening. I have several questions. As uh, more and more seniors are going online and joining Facebook to keep in contact with their family, friends, and neighbors, uh, in your testimony, you walk us through the Facebook's efforts to recognize misinformation, what the company is doing to combat malicious actors using mani man manipulated media. Is Facebook doing anything specifically to help protect seniors from being targeted on the platform or educating them on how to recognize fake accounts or scams? Thank you for the question. We are indeed, uh, and that includes both in-person trainings for seniors, which we've done and will continue to do. We also have a guide that can be uh, more broadly distributed that's publicly available that is a guide for seniors on the best ways to keep themselves safe. But I want to say more broadly, and as a somebody who is a federal criminal prosecutor for 11 years looking at that, that sort of behavior, this is something we take seriously across the board. We don't want anybody to be using Facebook to uh, scam somebody else, and we look proactively for that sort of behavior and remove it. Uh, just a quick follow-up. <coughs> I think it's really important because, uh, you know, from what we've learned in a lot of times is that seniors don't want to report things because they're afraid that, boy, you know, I, I've, been, I've been taken. I don't want to tell my relatives. I don't want to tell my friends because they're afraid of losing some of uh, what they might have. And not just on the money side, but uh, uh, they're, what, how they can uh, get out there. And so I think it's really important that we always think about our seniors and just to follow up, uh, because at the uh, workshop that we had in the district last year, the FTC uh, stated that one of the best ways to combat scams is to educate the individuals on how to recognize the illegal behavior so they can turn, in, uh, they can, uh, turn that in to educate their friends and neighbors. In addition to your private sector partnerships with Facebook, we're willing to partner with agencies like the FTC to make sure that the public is informed about scammers operating on their platform. Congressman, I'm very happy to follow up on that. We think it's important for people to understand the tools that are available to keep themselves safe online. Ms. Donovan? Yeah, one of the things that we should also consider is the way in which people are targeted by age for, uh, I've looked at reverse mortgage scams, uh, retirement funding scams, uh, fake health care supplements, uh, you know, when you do retire, it becomes very confusing. You're looking for information. And if you're looking primarily on Facebook and then posting about it, you might be retargeted by the advertising system itself. And so even when you're not information seeking, Facebook's algorithms and advertising are giving other third parties information that, and then serving advertising to seniors. And so it is a persistent problem. Thank you. Uh, again, and Ms. Bickert, if I could just uh, follow up quickly with my uh, remaining 30 seconds. Uh, many of the scammers look for ways to get around uh, Facebook's policies, including through the development and refinement of new technologies and techniques. 
Is Facebook dedicating the resources to exploring ways to proactively combat scams and, uh, instead of reacting after the fact? Yes, Congressman, uh, we are. I've been uh, overseeing content policies at Facebook for about seven years now. And in that time, I would say that we've gone from being primarily reactive in the way that we enforce our policies to now primarily proactive. We are really going after abusive content and trying to find it. We grade ourselves based on uh, how much we are finding before people report it to us. And we are now publishing reports to that effect. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, my time has expired and I yield back. Um, the gentleman yields uh, back, and I now recognize Mr. O'Halloran for uh, five minutes. I want to thank the chairwoman uh, for holding this imp important and timely meeting here today, hearing. I echo the concerns of my colleagues. Uh, the types of deceptive online practices that have been discussed today are deeply troubling. I've continually stressed that a top priority for Congress should be securing our U.S. elections. We could see dangerous consequences if the right tools are not in place to prevent the spread of misinformation online. This is a national security concern. As a former law enforcement officer, I understand that laws can be meaningless if they are not enforced. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses about the FTC's capabilities and resources to combat these deceptive online practices. Uh, Dr. Donovan, in your testimony, you say that uh, regulatory gar guardrails are needed to protect users from being misled online. I share your concerns about deception and manipulation online, including the rise in use of the dark patterns, deep flakes, and other kinds of bad practices that can harm consumers. Can you explain in more detail what sort of regulatory guardrails are necessary to prevent uh, these instances? Um, I'll go into one very briefly. Uh, one of the big questions is, if I post something online, that's not an advertisement. It's not, you know, I'm just trying to inform my known networks. The problem isn't necessarily always just that there's a piece of fake content out there. The, the real problem is the scale, being able to reach millions. Right, 2010, 2011, we lauded that as a virtue of platforms. It really emboldened many of our important social movements and, and raised some incredibly important issues. But that wasn't false information. It wasn't meant to deceive people. It wasn't meant to siphon money um, out of other groups. At that time, too, you weren't really uh, able to scale donations. You weren't really, uh, it was much harder to create networks of fake accounts. Uh, and pretend to be an entire constituency. And so when I talk about regulatory guardrails, we have to think about distribution differently than we think about the content. And then we can also assuage some of the fears that we have about freedom of expression by looking at what are the mechanisms by which people can break out of their known networks? Is it advertising? Is it the use of fake accounts? How are people going viral? How are posts going viral, information going viral? The other thing I'd like to know from the government perspective is, does the FTC, F, FTC have enough insight into platforms to monitor that, to understand that? And if they don't, if they don't know why and how tens of millions of dollars are being siphoned out of Trump's campaign, then that's also another problem. And we have to think about what is transparency, what does auditing look like in a very meaningful way. Uh, doctor, do you believe then that the FTC has the adequate authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act uh, to take action against individuals and companies engaged in sex deceptive behavior practices online? And I, I, I do want to point out a Wall Street Journal a report that said of, of the millions of dollars, 200 and some million dollars of uh, fines, uh, that they've only collected about $7,000 since, 19, uh, since 2015. Wow. So. Um, I think that you do have to look a lot closer at what the FTC has access to and how they can make that information actionable. It, it, for example, proving that there's substantial injury, if only one 
group has access to the known costs or knows the, the enormity of a, a scam, then we have to be able to expedite uh, the transfer of data and the investigation in such a way that we're not relying on journalists or researchers or civil society organizations to investigate. I think that the investigatory powers of the FCC have to also include uh, assessing substantial injuries. Thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Do you, uh, Mr. Harris, do you believe the uh, agency has enough resources to responsibly, swiftly, and appropriately address the issues? And I just want to point out that uh, we flatline them all the time. <laughs> and on the other side, the industry continues to expand at, at, at exponential rates. And so I'd like I think to hear that. That's the issue that you're pointing to, is that the problem creating aspects of the technology industry, because they operate at exponential scales, create exponential you know, issues, harms, problems, scams, et cetera. And so how do you, um, you know, have a small body reach such large capacities? I think this is why I'm thinking about how can we have a digital update for each of our different agencies who already have jurisdiction over whether it's public health or children or scams or deception, and just have them ask the questions that then are forced upon the technology companies to use their resources to calculate, report back, set the objection, set the uh, goals for what they're going to do in the next quarter. Thank to you, Mr. Harrison. I yield. The chair now recognizes Mr. Carter for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. This is extremely important and extremely important to all of our citizens. I want to start by saying that, um, you know, when we talk about deep fake and cheap fake, to me that's somewhat black and white. I can understand it. But, M Mr. Hurwitz, when we talk about dark patterns, I, get a, I think that's more gray in, in my mind. And I'll just give you an example. I was a retailer for many years, and I grew up in the South, okay? We had a grocery store chain, many, somebody might, some of you may be familiar with it, Piggly Wiggly. Now, I always heard that the way they got their name, and I tried to fact check it, but I couldn't find it. But anyway, I always heard the way they got their name is they arranged their stores to when you went in, you had to kind of wiggle all the way around before you could get back out so that you'd buy more things. And it was like a pig wiggling through the, through the farmyard or something, and, and they came up with Piggly Wiggly. Well, that's, that's marketing. And, 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 you know, another example is all of us go to the grocery store. We're, when we're at the grocery store and you're in the checkout line, you got all these things up there that they're trying to get you to buy. They're not necessarily, or you could argue that they're impulse items. But then again, you could also make the argument that when you get home, you say, geez, I wish I would have. I'd gotten that at the grocery store. I wish I would have gotten these batteries or Band-Aids or, or whatever. How do you differentiate between what's harmful and what is beneficial? Uh, great question, um, because it is gray. And as I said uh, previously, dark patterns, the term itself is a dark pattern intended to make us think about uh, this as dark. There are some clear categories, uh, uh, clear lies, clear false statements, um, where we're talking about classic deception. That's pretty straightforward. But when we're talking in about more behavioral nudges, it becomes much more difficult. Uh, academics have studied nudges uh, uh, for decades at this point, um, and it's hard to predict when they're going to be effective, when they're not going to be. In the FTC context, uh, uh, the deception standard has a materiality requirement, so there needs to be some demonstration that a uh, practice is material to the consumer harm, um, and that's a good sort of framework. If we don't have some sort of uh, demonstrable harm harm requirement and a causal connection there. I, I'm a law professor. Causation is a basic element of any legal claim. If you don't have some ability to tie the act to the harm, you're in uh, uh, dark uh, uh, waters for due process. So do you think we should be in instructing the FTC to, to conduct um, research on this as, as to, to what is, is going on here? I think uh, more information is good information. The FTC is conducting some uh, uh, hearings already. Um, I think greater investigation is uh, very powerful, both so that the FTC understands uh, what they should be doing so they can use this information to establish rules where materiality is difficult to establish. The FTC can issue a rule, go through a, a rulemaking process, which makes it easier to substantiate an enforcement action subsequently. And even uh, to respond in part to a, a previous question, uh, to the extent that one of the FTC's core powers 
even if it doesn't lack this as an enforcement authority, is to report to this body and say, look, we are seeing this practice, it is problematic, we don't have the authority, can you do something about it? And perhaps this body will act and give it uh, power, perhaps this body will take direct, direct action, or perhaps the platforms and the uh, uh, other entities will say, oh wow, the, the jig's up. We should change our practices before Congress does something that could be even more detrimental to us. Right. Mr. Harris, did you have some? Uh, yes, I, I've studied this topic for also about a decade. So the, um, what you asked what's different about this. You've got the pig going through the thing, you've got the supermarket aisle, you've got the last minute of sort of last minute purchase items. There's two distinct things that are different. The first is that this is infrastructure we live by. This is your, this, when you talk about children waking up in the morning and you have autoplay, you don't, that's not like the, the supermarket where I occasionally go there and I just made some purchases and I'm at the very end of it and that's the one moment, the one little micro situation of deception or, or, or marketing, which is okay. Um, in this case, we have children who are like spending 10 hours a day. So imagine a supermarket, you're spending 10 hours a day and you wake up in that supermarket. And that's, so that's the degree of intimacy and, and sort of scope in our lives. That's the first thing. The second thing is the degree of asymmetry between the persuader and the persuadee. So in this case, you've got someone who knows a little bit more about marketing, who's arranging the shelf space so that the things in the top are at eye level versus the bottom level. That's one it's a very small amount of asymmetry. But in the case of technology, we have a supercomputer pointed at your brain, meaning like the Facebook news feed sitting there, and using the vast resources of 2.7 billion people's behavior to calculate the perfect thing to show you next and to not be discriminant about whether it's good for you, whether it's true, whether it's trustworthy, whether it's credible. And so it knows way more about your weaknesses than you know about yourself, and the degree of asymmetry is far beyond anything we've experienced. And you want the federal government to control that? I think we have to ask questions about when, when there's that degree of asymmetry, um, about intimate aspects of your weaknesses, and its business model is to exploit that asymmetry. It's as if a psychotherapist who knows everything about your weaknesses uses it with a for-profit advertising business model. The, the challenge is that can also go the other way. It can be used to strength. Uh, Mr. Harris. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Harris used the example uh, uh, earlier of what if autoplay is shifting us towards conspiracy theories? Okay, that's a dark pattern. That's bad. What if instead it was using us to shift us the other way, to the light, to greater education? If we say autoplay is bad, then we're taking both of those options off the table. This can be used for good. And the question that you asked about how do we differentiate between good uses and bad, that's the question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. This is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for holding this very important hearing that unfortunately, I think most Americans don't understand how important this is to every single one of us, especially to our, our children and future generations. Um, uh, there's an app, TikTok, question mark. Um, is it a deep fake maker? Uh, five days ago, uh, TechCrunch reported that ByteDance, the parent company of the popular video sharing app TikTok, may have secretly built a deep fake maker. Although there is no indication that TikTok intends to actually introduce this feature, the prospect of deepfake technology being made available on such a massive scale and on a platform that is so popular with kids raises a number of troubling questions. So my question to you, Mr. Harris, is in your testimony, you discuss at length the multitude of ways that children are harmed by new technology. Can you talk about why this news may be concerning? Um, yes, thank you for, for the question. Uh, so deep fakes is a, is a really complex issue. I think if you look at how other governments are responding to this, um, uh, I don't mean to look at China for legal guidance, but they, they see this as so threatening to their society, the fabric of truth and trust in their society, that if you, do, if you post a deep fake without labeling it clearly as a deep fake, you can actually go to jail. So they're not saying if you post a deep fake, you go to jail. They're saying if you post it without labeling it, you go to jail. You can imagine a world where Facebook says, if you post a deep fake without labeling it, we actually maybe uh, suspend your account for 24 hours. So that you sort of feel, that, and, there's a and we label your account to other people who see your account. So hold on a second. Uh, my, my colleague on the other side of the aisle just warned, quote, and you want to have the government control this? You just gave an example of where private industry could, in fact, create deterrence That's right. to bad behavior. They could do Not so the government, but actual industry. 
Okay, go ahead. No, so that's, that's right. And so they, they can create, and that's the point, is instead of using these AI whack-a-mole approaches, where the engineers at Facebook, how many engineers at Facebook speak the 22 languages of India, right, where there was an election last year? They're, they're controlling the information infrastructure, not just for this country, but for every country, and they don't speak the languages of the countries that they operate in, and they're automating that, and instead of trying to use AI where they're just missing everything going by, yes, they've made many investments, we should celebrate that, there's people working very hard, it's much better than it was before, but they have created a digital Frankenstein where there is far more content, advertising, variations of text, lies, et cetera, than they have the capacity to deal with. And so you can't create problems way beyond the scope of your ability to, to address them. It'd be like creating nuclear power plants everywhere with the risk of meltdown without actually having a plan for security. Now, now getting back to your example where industry could, in fact, for example, Facebook could say, we're going to suspend your account for 24 hours or something like that. With all due respect, in that example, Facebook might lose a little bit of revenue as well as the person that they're trying to deter from bad action is likely going to lose revenue as well, correct? That's correct, but maybe that's an acceptable cost given we're talking about the total meltdown. Yes, but maybe it's acceptable when you look at it intellectually and honestly, but when you look at it, whether or not private industry is going to take it upon themselves to actually impact their shareholders' revenue, that's where government has a place and space to get involved and say, Proper actions and reactions need to be put in place so that people can understand that you can't and you shouldn't just look at this from a profit center motive. That's right. Because in this world, sometimes the negative actions are more profitable for somebody out there than positive good actions. And, and that's one of the things that's unfortunate. And you talk about languages around the world, but the number one target, in my opinion, for these bad actions for both financial gain and also the tearing down of the fabric of the democracy of the greatest nation on the planet, the United States, is the United States. We are the biggest target for various reasons. Two main reasons is because we're supposed to be the shining light on the hill for the rest of the world of what a good democracy should be like. And secondly, we are by far and away the largest economy, the biggest consumer group of folks on the planet. So therefore, there is a motive for people to focus on profit and focus on their negative bad intentions against our interests, the, the interests of the American people. Is that accurate? That's, that's exactly right. And this is a national security. I see this as a long-term. I mean, the polarization dynamics are, are accelerating towards civil war level things. Hashtag civil war is coming. There's a, our colleague, Rene Diresta, says, if you can make it trend, you can make it true. When you're planting these suggestions and getting people to even think those thoughts because you can manipulate the architecture, we're profiting. That's why I said we're subsidizing our own self-destruction if, if the government doesn't say that these things can't just be profitable. Thank you uh, to the witnesses, and thank you, Mr. Harris. I, I, I run out of time. I wish I had more time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and now I recognize Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, been my experience that uh, a lie seems to be able to travel faster on the Internet than the speed of light, while the truth always goes at such a snail's pace. And I suppose that's because of the algorithms we see. I want to start with uh, deep fakes and cheap fakes. We know through New York Times v. Sullivan that um, defamation of public figures require actual malice, and some of these just appear to be malicious on their face. Uh, I appreciate the labeling, uh, Ms. Bickert, that uh, Facebook is doing now. That's something that we actually were pondering in our office uh, as well. But why wouldn't Facebook simply just take down the fake Pelosi video? Thank you for the question. Our approach is to give people more information so that if something is going to be in the public discourse, they will know how to assess it, how to contextualize it. That's why we work with the fact checkers. I will say that in the past six months, it's feedback from uh, academics and, and civil society groups that has led us to come up with stronger warning screens. Would that so, be labeled under your current policy now as false, that video? I'm sorry, which video? Would the fake Pelosi video be labeled as false under your new policy just announced? 
it, yes, and it, and it, it, it was uh, labeled false at the time. We did, we think we could have gotten that to fact checkers faster, and we think the label that we put on it could have been more clear. We now have uh, the label for something that has been rated false. You have to click through it, so it actually obscures the image, and it says false information, and it says this has been rated false by fact checkers. You have to click through it, and you see information from uh, the fact checking source. Thanks. In uh, 2016, there was a fake Trump rally put together by Russians in Florida, uh, complete with uh, Hillary Clinton in a prison and a fake Bill Clinton. Could a fake rally be created today through Facebook in the United States by the Russians under existing technology? The network that created that was fake and inauthentic and we removed it, we were slow to find it. I think our enforcement has gotten a lot better and as a data point for that, um, in uh, 2016, we removed one such network. This past year, we removed more than 50 networks. Now that's a global number all over the world, but these are organizations that are using networks of accounts, some fake, some real, uh, in an attempt to obscure who they are or to push false information. So, so could it happen again right now? Our, our enforcement is not perfect. However, I think we've made huge strides and that is shown by the uh, dramatic increase in the number of uh, networks that we've removed. And I will say that we do it not just by ourselves, but we work with security firms and academics who are studying this to make sure we're staying on top of it. What do you think Facebook's duty is, to, as well as other social media platforms, to prevent the spread of lies across the internet? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What do you think Facebook and other social uh, platforms duty is to prevent the spread of lies across the internet? I'm, I can speak for Facebook. We think it's important for people to be able to connect safely and with authentic information. And my team is responsible for both. So there is our approach to misinformation where we try to get people uh, label content that is false and get them accurate information, and then there is everything that we also do to remove abusive content that violates our standards. Thank you, Ms. Bicker. Uh, Dr. Donovan, I saw you reacting uh, to the fake Trump rally aspect. Could that still happen uh, now under existing uh, safeguards in social media? Yeah, and the reason why it can still happen is because of the, the platform's openness is now turning into a bit of a, a vulnerability for the rest of society. So um, what's dangerous about events like that is uh, the, the kind of research we do, we're often trying to understand, well, what's happening online and what happens when the wires, the interaction between the wires and the weeds? Like when people start to be mobilized, start to show up places, that to us is one order of magnitude much more dangerous. What do you think we should be doing as government to help prevent something like there's ways in which I think when people are using um, uh, particularly events features, group features, there has to be added transparency about who, what, when, where the, those, um, those events are being organized by. And there have been instances in Facebook very recently where they've added transparency pages, but it's not always clear uh, to the user who's behind what page and for what reason uh, they're <laughs> launching a, a protest. What's dangerous, though, is that actual constituents show up. Real people show up as, as fodder for this. And so we have to be really careful that they don't stage different parties like they did in Texas across the street from one another uh, at the same time. And so we don't want to have, um, you know, manipulation that creates this uh, serious problem for law enforcement as well as uh, others in the area. Thanks, my time has expired. Now recognize uh, Congresswoman Matsui for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I really appreciate the witnesses here today upon, especially on this, this really important issue. I introduced the Blockchain Promotion Act with Congressman Guthrie to direct the Department of Commerce to convene a working group of stakeholders to develop a consensus-based definition of blockchain. Currently, there is no common definition which has hindered its deployment. Blockchain technology could have interesting applications in the communication space, including new ways of identity verification. 
This technology is unique in that it can help distinguish between credible and non-credible news sources in a decentralized fashion, rather than relying on one company or organization to serve as a sole gatekeeper. Um, I would like, really, I have a lot of questions. I like succinct, succinct answers to this. Um, Ms. Donovan, do you see value in promoting impartial, decentralized methods of identity verification as a tool to combat the spread of misinformation? I think in limited cases, yes, especially around purchasing of advertising, which is allowing you to break out of your known networks and to reach other people, especially if those advertising features do allow you to target very specific groups. Okay. Um, I'm interested in learning more about this consensus on definition because I also think it might help us understand what is a social media company, what are their, how do we define their broadcast mechanisms, how do we define them related to the media, uh, media company as well as the other kinds of products that they build. And I think it would also get us a lot further in understanding what it is we say when we say deep fakes or even sure. AI. Okay, um, the European Commission has recently announced that it will be supporting research to advance blockchain technology to support a more accurate online news environment. The entire panel, just a yes or no is sufficient. Do you believe the U.S. should be keeping pace with Europe in this space? Yes or no? As far as blockchain, do you think that the European Commission is supporting research to advance blockchain technology to support a more accurate online news development? Do you believe that the U.S. should be keeping pace with Europe regarding this? Uh, although this is not my area, generally we think research and understanding is a good thing. Okay. Um, Ms. Dr. Donovan, I'd probably say you... Yeah, more, more research could help yeah. us understand this better. Mr. Hurwitz, yes or no? Uh, around the world, many are outpacing us in blockchain. Okay. Mr. Harris? Uh, it's not my area, but I, I know that China's working on a decentralized currency and could mm -hmm. basically get all of the countries in which it's indebting them to their infrastructure with these huge uh, Belt and Road plans. If they switch the global currency to their decentralized currency, that's a major national security threat sure. and would change the entire world order. I think much more work has to be done to the US in the US to protect against China gaining uh, currency advantage and changing the world reserve currency. Thank you. Um, it's an undisputed fact reaffirmed by America's intelligence agencies that Russia interfered in our 2016 and 18 elections through targeted and prolonged online campaigns. We know that Russia is ramping up for 2020, and the American voters will once again be exposed to new lies, falsehoods, and misinformation designed to sow division in our democratic process. While I was glad to see the recent funding bill included $425 million in election security grants, this is only part of a much larger solution to protect the most fundamental function of our democracy, social media companies need to take clear, forceful action against foreign attempts to interfere with our elections. Mr. Harris, how have the various election interference strategies evolved from the 2016 and 2018 election cycles? Um, you know, I'm actually not an expert on exactly what Russia is, is doing now. What I'll say is I think that we need a mass public awareness campaign um, to inoculate the public. Think of it as like a cultural vaccine. And there's actually precedent in the United States for this. So back in the 1940s, we had the Committee for National Morale and the Institute for Propaganda Analysis that actually did a domestic awareness campaign about the threat of fascist propaganda. You've probably seen the videos from or Black and White from 1947. It was called Don't Be a Sucker. Oh. And they had us looking at a guy spouting fascist propaganda, and someone starting to nod, and then the guy taps him on the shoulder and says, now son, that's fascist propaganda, and here's how to spot it. We actually saw this as a deep threat, a national security threat to our country. We, we could have another mass public awareness campaign now, and we could have the help of the technology companies to collectively use their distribution to, to um, uh, distribute that inoculation campaign so everybody actually knew the threat of the problem. Uh, the rest of the panel agree with Mr. Harris on this, to have this public awareness campaign? Broadly, I'll just note that it runs the risk of being called a dark pattern if the platforms are starting to label certain content in certain ways. So there's a cross-current of our discussion to note there. Okay, well, we don't come to any solutions now, but I appreciate it, and I've run out of time. Thank you very much. Congresswoman, I, I would just point to the ads library that we have uh, put in place over the past few years, which has really brought an unprecedented level of openness to political advertising. So people can now see who's behind an ad, who paid for it, um, and we verify the identity of those advertisers. Difficult for most people out there to really do that, uh, you know, unless it's right in front of them. So, but I'm glad that that's happening, but I think we should 
have much more exposure about this. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Well, I thank the chair and I thank the witnesses. Uh, your testimonies have been very helpful and I appreciate it. Uh, but I have to say, uh, with big power comes big responsibility. Um, and I'm disappointed, in my opinion, that Facebook hasn't really stepped up to that responsibility. Back in June, I sent a letter to Mr. Zuckerberg and I was joined by nearly all the Democrats on the committee. In this letter, we noted that we're concerned about the potential conflict of interest between Facebook's bottom line uh, and addressing misinformation on its platform. Six months later, I remain very concerned that Facebook is putting its bottom line ahead of addressing misinformation. Uh, Ms. Berger, Facebook's content monetization policy, monetization policy states that content that depicts or discusses subjects in the following categories may face reduced or restricted monetization and misinformation is included in the list. It's troubling that your policy doesn't simply ban misinformation. Uh, do you think there are cases where misinformation can and should be monetized? Please answer yes or no. Uh, Congressman, no, if we see somebody that is intentionally sharing misinformation and we make this clear in our policies, they will lose the ability to monetize. Okay, well that sounds different than what's in your company's stated policy. Uh, but the response I received from Facebook to my letter failed to answer many of my questions. For example, I asked the following question that was left unanswered and I'd like to give you a chance to answer it today. How many project managers does Facebook employ whose full-time job it is to address misinformation? Congressman, I don't have a number of PMs. I can tell you that across my team, um, our engineering teams and our content review teams, this is something that's a priority. Building that network of uh, the relationships with more than 50 fact-checking organizations is something that has taken the efforts of a number of teams across the company. Does that include software engineers? Uh, it does because there's for all of for any of these uh, programs, you need to have an infrastructure that can help uh, recognize when something might be misinformation, allow people to report when something might be misinformation, get things over to to the fact checking organizations. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to provide that information. How many full time employees, including software engineers, are employed in that in uh, uh, identifying happy, misinformation? We're happy to try to follow up and answer. Another question that was left unanswered. Um, is on average, from, t from the time a content is posted on Facebook's platform, how long does it take for Facebook to flag suspicious content to third party fast checkers, third party fact checkers to review the content, and Facebook to take remedial action uh, once the content, once the review is completed? Uh, Congressman, the answer depends. This could happen very quickly. We actually allow fact-checking organizations to proactively rate content they see on Facebook. Do so you think that'll be fast enough to keep deep fakes from going viral or other misinformation from going viral? If, if they rate something proactively, then it happens instantly. And we also use technology and user reporting to flag content to them, and we often see that they will, will rate it very quickly. Well, <coughs> I'm moving on. I'm very concerned that Facebook Book is not prepared to address in misinformation on its platform in advance, of, in advance of this year's election. Will you commit to having a third party audit conducted by June 1st of Facebook's practices for combating the spread of disinformation on its platform and for the results of this audit to be made available to the public? Congressman, we're very happy to answer any questions about how we do what we do. We think transparency is important, and we're happy to follow up with any suggestions that you have. We, we would, I would request a third party audit. And not, we're not talking about uh, the civil, service, civil rights audit, uh, an independent third party audit to be conducted at Facebook by June 1st. Uh, Congressman, again, we're very transparent about what our policies and practices are, and we're happy to follow up with uh, any specific suggestions. Mr. Harris? I was just going to say, um, the third-party fact-checking services are massively understaffed, underfunded, and a lot of people are dropping out of the program, and the amount of information flowing through that channel is far beyond their capacity to respond. More or less, fact-checking isn't even really the, the relevant issue. I think if you look at the clearest evidence of this, 
is Facebook's own employees wrote a letter to Mark Zuckerberg saying you are undermining our election integrity efforts with your current political ads policy. That says it all to me. And that letter was leaked to the New York Times about a month ago. Uh, I think that those people, because they're closest to the problem, they do the research queries, they understand how bad the issue is. Look, we're on the outside. We don't actually know. It's almost like they're Exxon, but they also own the satellites that would show us how much pollution there is. So we don't actually know on the outside. So all we can do is trust people like that on the inside that are saying this is far less than what we would like to do. And they still have not updated their policy. All right, thank you. I'll yield back. Uh, I recognize Congresswoman Dingle for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank all of you for being here today. It's a subject that really matters to me, like it does to all of us. But in the past, we've treated what little protections people have online as something that's separate from those we have in our day-to-day -day lives, offline. But the line between what happens online and offline is virtually non-existent. And gone are the days when we can separate one from the other. Millions of Americans have been affected by data breaches and privacy abuses. The numbers are so large that you can't even wrap your head around them. I mean, I've talked to members here and they don't even at times understand what has happened or how people have collected data about us. The resources to help folks protect themselves after the fact are desperately needed. But what's really happening is that the cost of failure to protect sensitive information is being pushed on millions of people who are being breached and not trying to do anything. It's a market externality. And that's where the government, I believe, must step in. You go to the pharmacy to fill a prescription, you assume that the medicine you're gonna get is gonna be, not, it's gonna be safe, it's not gonna kill you. If you go outside, you assume that the air you breathe, you assume is gonna be safe, or we're trying to make it that way. And that's because we have laws that protect people from a long list of known market externalities and the burden isn't placed on their ability to find out, is the medicine you're taking okay, safe, and is the air you're breathing clean? We're still working on that, but uh, it's one we've identified. It shouldn't be any different for market externalities that are digital. So, Ms. Bickert, I will admit, I've sent a letter to Facebook today, which has a lot of questions that didn't lend themselves to answer here, so I hope that they will be answered. But I'd like to get yes or no answers from the panel on the following questions. And I'm going to start this way with Mr. Harris, because we always start with you, Ms. Bickert, and we'll give you a little. And thank you for being here, even though you're sick. Do you believe that the selling of real-time cell phone location without user's consent constitutes a market externality? Mr. Harris. I don't know what that specific one, but the entire surveillance capitalism system produces vast harms that are all on the balance sheets of societies, whether that's the mental health of children, the uh, manipulation of, of elections, the breakdown of polarization. But it's a market ability. externality. It's absolutely all market externality. Okay, let's go down. Mr. Hurwitz. Based on the economic definition of an externality, no, it is not. However, it can be problematic. Dr. Donovan? Um, in line with Gus. Ms. Bickert? I'm not an economist, but we do think user consent is very important. Do you, but second question, yes or no. Do you believe that having 400 million pieces of personally identifiable information made public, including passport numbers, names, addresses, and payment information is a market externality? Mr. Harris? Uh, similarly on sort of the classic economic definition, I don't know if that would specifically qualify, but it's deeply alarming. Uh, same answer. Agreed. Same answer. So are you all agreeing with Mr. Harris? Uh, the same answer as I uh, gave previously. It's not just uh, the to technical economic see definition. see if we had gotten you to understand what a bother it is. Uh, three, do you believe that having 148 million individuals personally identifiable information, including credit card numbers, driver's license, and social security numbers made public is a market externality? Mr. Harris? Yeah, I can see it's sort of like an oil spill externality. Mr. Hurwitz? Same answer. So you don't think it's a problem? Uh, I don't, I don't not think it's a problem. I wouldn't categorize it as an externality and use it as a just. So you don't think we've got to protect people from that? 
No, that's not why I'm saying. I, I have an economics background. I rely on a more technical definition of an externality. Dr. Donovan? Uh, it's an incredibly uh, important problem. Ms. Bicker? Uh, yes, I would echo Dr. Donovan. Do you believe that having the data of 87 million users taken and used for nefarious political purposes is a market externality? Mr. Harris? Uh, I think it's the same answer as before. Yep. It's with this class. If, if I break into your house and steal your stuff and sell it on the black market, that is not an externality. However, it is a problem. Dr. Donovan? Well, I wouldn't characterize it as a break-in. It was facilitated by the features built into the platform, and I, it's a huge problem. Thank you. Ms. Bickert? Again, we think that user control and consent is very important. Okay, I'm going to do the last question. I'm out of time, so you're going to have to be fast. And finally, do you believe that simply asking whoever took it to please delete it is an appropriate response? Mr. Harris? Uh, it's very hard to enforce that, and the, the, once the data is out there, it's distributed everywhere. So yep. we have to live in a world where now we assume that this is just out, it's there. out there. You need to solve the problem on the front end. Dr. Donovan. That never should have been allowed in the first place. Ms. Bicker. Again, we think that it is very important to give people control over their data, and we're doing our best to make sure that we're doing that. So I'm out of time, but thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, thank you to the chairwoman in her absence, and thank you to the panelists. Um, this is a vitally important conversation that we're having. Um, what I've noticed is that technology is outpacing policy and the people. And so we're feeling the impacts in our mental health, we're feeling it in our economy, we're feeling it in our form of government. And so this is a very important conversation. And I'd like to start with a few questions that are kind of off uh, of the dark patterns and, and those issues, but really do deal with the idea of deceptive and manipulative practices. And it's just a, a basic question. So yes or no, um, are the, and it's really surrounding the platforms that we have and uh, the ability for people with disabilities to use them. Uh, are each of you or any of you familiar with the term universal design? And I'll just ask Mr. Harris. Uh, vaguely, yes. Mr. Hurwitz. Vaguely, yes. 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 Vaguely, yes. Vaguely. Okay, so there were a lot of vaguelys, and um, and I, I don't have time to really talk about what universal design is, but I think as we look at how people are treated in our society, um, universal design and looking at people with disabilities is one of the areas that I'd like to follow up with each of you on. Um, I'd now like to turn my time to a discussion about um, dark patterns. And every single member of Congress uh, and every one of our constituencies, virtually everyone, has been affected by this in some respect um, every day, whether it's giving up our location data, uh, are manipulated into purchasing products that they don't need, or providing sensitive information that enables scams. Many of us are targeted. Uh, and while the failure to address dark patterns harms individuals, one of the areas that uh, is of deeper concern to me is the challenge for us as a society as a whole. Cambridge Analytica, that scandal in and of itself was a great example for all of us of it wasn't just an individual that was harmed, it was our society and we see some of the remnants of it to this day. And so uh, I, I, I heard someone say to me yesterday that they hoped that this hearing was not just a hearing but a real wake up call a wake-up call to our country. And so my first question is to Mr. Harris. Um, do you believe that oversight of dark patterns and the other deceptive and manipulative practices discussed here are well-suited for industry self-regulation? Uh, no, absolutely not. And I would like to follow up with uh, Ms. Beckert. Um, does Facebook have a responsibility to develop user interfaces that are transparent and fair to its users? We definitely want that, and, and yes, I think we are working on new ways to be transparent all the time. Does Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act provide immunities to Facebook over these issues? Uh, Section 230 is an important part of my team being able to do what we do. So yes, it, it gives us the ability to proactively look for abuse and remove it. But, but does it provide immunities, you would say yes? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, what's... 
what's the specific? So Section 230 does provi provide us certain protections. The most important from my standpoint is the ability for us to go after abuse on our platform. Um, but separately, it's also an important mechanism for people who use the internet to be able to post to platforms like Facebook. I guess one of my um, concerns here for asking that question is we're having a big conversation about the balance of freedom of speech in addition to the ability to people, for people to yell fire in a crowded, crowded place. And so I'm going to turn um, back to uh, Mr. Harris. How do you um, think that we in Congress can develop a more agile and responsive response to the concerning trends on the internet? You mentioned a digital update of federal agencies. Could you talk a little bit about that as well? Just as you said, that the problem here is we have, this is E.O. Wilson, uh, the problem of humanity is we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and accelerating godlike technology. When your steering wheel goes about a light year behind your accelerating godlike technology, the system crashes. So the whole point is we have to give a digital update to some of the existing institutions, Health and Human Services, uh, FCC, FTC, uh, you can imagine every category of society and saying, where do we already have jurisdiction about each of these areas? And ask them to come up with a plan for what their digital update's going to be and put the tech companies in a direct relationship where every quarter there's an audit and there's a uh, set of actions that are gonna be taken to, to, to ameliorate these harms. And that's, how, that's the only way I can see scaling this absent creating a whole new digital federal agency, which will be you know, way too late for these issues. I, kn I know I'm running out of time, um, but my other question really was going to be to Ms. Bickhart on um, the role that you see of government. I think we're having a lot of conversations here about freedom of speech um, and also the role of government. And so as a follow-up, I, I would like to have a conversation with you about what you see as the, that role of government versus self-regulation and, and how we can make something uh, happen here. The bigger concern is for us to make sure that um, we're looking at this both as an individual level but also as a society. And I yield my time and I recognize the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark. I thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I thank our ranking members, I thank our panelists for their expert uh, witness here today. Uh, deepfakes currently pose a significant and unprecedented threat. Now more than ever, we need to prepare for the possibility that foreign adversaries will use deepfakes to spread disinformation and interfere in our election, which is why I've successfully secured language in the NDAA requiring notification be given to Congress if Russia or China seek to do exactly this. But deepfakes has been and will be used to harm individual Americans. We have already seen instances of women's images being superimposed on fake porn, pornographic videos, and these tools become more affordable and accessible, excuse me, as these tools become more affordable and accessible, we can expect deep fakes to be used to influence financial markets, discredit dissidents, and even incite violence. That's why I've introduced the first House bill to address this threat, the Deep Fakes Accountability Act, which requires creators to label deep fakes as altered content, updates our identity theft statutes for digital impersonation, and requires cooperation between the government and private sector to develop detection technologies. I'm now working on a second bill to specifically address how online platforms deal with deep fake content. So, uh, Dr. Donovan, uh, cheap fakes. We've often talked about deep fakes where the technology footprint uh, of the content has changed, but can you talk a bit more about the national security implications of cheap fakes, such as the Pelosi video, which, where footage is simply altered instead of entirely fabricated? One of the most uh, effective political uses of a cheap fake is to draw attention and shift the entire media narrative towards a false claim. And so particularly what we saw last week with the Biden video was concerning because you have hundreds of newsrooms kick into gear to dispute something, uh, a video, and platforms have allowed it to scale to a level where the public is uh, curious and are looking for that content and then are also coming into contact with other nefarious actors and networks. What and so, would you say can be done by government to counteract the threat? 
There, there has to be, I think you're moving very, very much in the direction I would go to where we need to have some labels, we need to understand the identity threat that it poses, and that there needs to be broader cooperation between governments. Um, as well, I, I think that the, the cost to journalism is very high because all of the energy and resources that go into um, tracking, mapping, and getting, you know, getting public information out there, uh, I think the platform companies can do a much better job of, of preventing that harm up front by looking at content when it does seem to uh, go wildly out of scale with the usual activity of an account Got and to, to proactively look at things where if you do see an uptick of 500,000 views on something, maybe there needs to be proactive content moderation. Very well. Ms. Bigger, Facebook is a founding member of the Deep Fake Technology Challenge. But detection is only partially a, a, technologi a technology issue. We also need to have a definition of what fake is and a policy for which kinds of fake videos are, are actually acceptable. One of the, uh, one of the, the things that I did uh, was, uh, excuse me, last summer you informed Congress that Facebook is working on a precise definition for what constitutes a deep fake. Deep fake, excuse me. Can you update us on those efforts, especially in light of your announcement yesterday? And specifically, specifically, how do you intend to differentiate between legitimate deep fakes, such as those created by Hollywood for entertainment, and malicious ones? Thank you for the question. Uh, the policy that we put out yesterday is uh, designed to address the most sophisticated types of uh, manipulated media and. This fits within the definition of uh, what many academics would call deep fakes so that we can remove it. Now, beyond that, we do think it's useful to work with others in industry and civil society and academia to actually have common definitions so we're all talking about the same thing. And those are conversations that we've been a part of uh, in the past six months. We will continue to be a part of those. And we are hoping that working together with industry and, and other stakeholders will be able to come up with uh, comprehensive definitions. Should the intent of the deep fake, or rather its subject matter, be the focus? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Should the intent of the deep fake or the subject matter be the focus? Uh, from our standpoint, it is often difficult to tell intent when we're talking about uh, many different types of abuse, but, but also specifically with uh, deep fakes or misinformation. And that's why if you look at our policy definition, it doesn't focus on intent so much as what the effect would be on the viewer. Thank you very much. I yield back. I thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, allowing my participation today. That, that concludes the, the questioning. Um, I have um, things I want to put into the, uh, into the record, and maybe the ranking member does as well. But I did want to um, make a, a, an ending comment, and I would welcome her to do the same if she wishes. Um, so we, uh, we had a discussion that took us to the grocery store. Um, but we are now in a new world that we're, that we're discussing that is hugely um, bigger. When we talk about Facebook, and as you say in your, in your testimony, Facebook is a community of more than two billion people spanning countries, cultures, and languages across the, the globe. But I think that there is now such an incredible and justified distrust of how we are being protected. Um, we know in the um, physical world, we do have laws that apply and that expectations of consumers are that those will be somehow there to protect us. But in fact, they aren't. We live then in the virtual world, in the digital world, in a place of self-regulation. And, and it seems to, to me that that has not satisfied expectations of consumers correctly. And we don't have institutions right now, even when they have the authorities, have the um, 
funding, have the expertise, I'm thinking of the Federal Trade Commission just as an example, um, to do what it needs to, to do. Um, but we um, don't have a regulatory framework at all um, to, that, that I think, hopefully in a bipartisan way, we can think about. Um, and it may include things like um, just the kinds of audits that you were talking about, Mr. Harris, which um, would um, not necessarily create new regulatory laws, but may, but we may need to. Um, and to me, um, that's the big takeaway today. When, when you have um, communities that are bigger than any country in the entire world that um, are essentially making decisions for all of the, the rest of us, and we know that we've been victimized, that the government of the United States of America does need to respond. That's, that's my uh, takeaway from, from this hearing, and I uh, appreciate hearing from the ranking member. Well, I thank I thank the the chair and I thank everyone for being here. I think it is important that we all become more educated. I wanted to bring to everyone's attention that the FTC is holding a hearing on January 28th regarding voice cloning. I think that it is a, it is important that all of us are participating, becoming better educated, and helping make sure that we are taking steps as we move forward. Clearly, this is a new era. And on one hand, we can celebrate that America has led the world in innovation and technology and improving our lives in many ways. And there's also this other side that we need to be looking at and making sure that we are taking the appropriate steps to keep people safe and secure. So we will we'll continue this important discussion and continue to become better educated. Today's hearing was a great part of that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I would uh, like to insert into the uh, the, the record um, the um, unan I seek unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the uh, record: a letter from the SAG um, Af AFTRA, um, a letter from R Street a paper written by Jeffrey um, Westling of the R Street uh, Institute, a report from the ATRA project on Facebook, um, and so I seek unanimous consent. Without objection, then so ordered. And <clears throat> so let me thank our uh, all of our witnesses today. We had good participation from members despite the fact that there were other hearings going on. Uh, I uh, remind members that person went to committee rules. They have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record um, to, uh, the, to be answered by the witnesses and hopefully in a reasonably short, uh, short time. We hope that there will be prompt answers and at this time, the subcommittee is adjourned. Ms. Bickert, you are free to go home to bed. <laughs>